Uh, it's still trying to. We do pretty much. Got it. Uh, all things sort of related to detection dogs, one way or another. Um, I guess I'll see a little bit, sort of by way of of hands, if you will, about a little bit about what your guys' makeup are. Most of you guys handlers. Do you handle dogs? Yep. A couple. Good. Um, is it mostly explosives, narcotics? All right. Sorry, I'm trying to make my visual a little bit bigger. There you go. I can actually see you guys now. Sorry, I'm not actually there, but now I can see you guys perfectly. Uh, great. All right. Well, today I'll be talking a little bit about sort of all things related to dogs, as well as a little bit about um, sort of the science behind their sense of smell. And please uh, stop me at any time. Uh, if you have a question, I know it's probably less interactive not being there in person, but the goal of this is to be uh, interactive and I've got a lot of time. So uh, stop me wherever you guys would like some clarifications and I'd be happy to, to, uh, to go through that. Uh, so goal one today is just going to explore some common questions in canine olfaction. We're going to talk a little bit about sort of the importance of concentration, as sort of a, a thing to program for within training. Um, you guys might have already or will be hearing soon from uh, Dr. Deshant, who's been in my lab and working on this type of area. I won't cover the same things that she'll be talking about. I'll be covering from a, uh, a couple of different experiments, but nonetheless, they sort of line up with a lot of the results that she'll be talking to you about uh, as well. We're going to talk about canine odor mixture perception. Perhaps you guys have heard about the sort of common stew theory uh, or how dogs perceive odor mixtures. I'm going to try and break that down a little bit from a scientific perspective. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some work that we've been doing about the use of detection dogs and different types of agricultural or biosecurity types of applications. That's a little bit different from your typical sort of narcotics and explosives work. So question one, uh, this was sort of the first question I had when I started down this road uh, almost 10 years ago now, is sort of where is the go-to source to understand the science behind sort of the dog's nose? And my questions were, is, you know, where is sort of that um, body of literature, body of scientific work to kind of to, to start as a basis? And while that's been changing over, I'd say the last five or six years, I think the answer really is, is, is nose buddy. I think uh, that that's the best nose pun I've got for today. So it's either too early in the morning because I didn't hear enough laughter or we'll see, but it's all downhill from there. Um, but uh, the point of that is, is that our sense of smell, whether it be our dogs or our own, is an incredibly complicated process. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll see out there, uh, particularly Facebook, maybe you guys like to get into your own Facebook arguments, um, that sort of reduces or is very reductive of how odor and, and odor perception works. And it's typically substantially more complicated than what we know. And the ultimate answer is there's a lot of unknowns about how our noses even work, let alone how a rodent's nose works, let alone how a dog's nose works. So there's a lot of things that will kind of be left a little uncertain at the end of today, and that's okay because science is still making its progress and there's still a lot for us to learn. Uh, so unfortunately that means that a lot of times you might get, have some questions and the answer will, will quite literally be, I don't know. Um, and that's normal. That's just an area of, of still a lot of work to be done. And um, I think that's something sort of uh, that highlights the importance of, of work that is, is yet to be done versus sort of this is a, an, an old hat kind of area of science. So the first question we, we get a lot, or one thing that we like to think about is, well, what is our dog's threshold for a variety of different odors? And what I mean by that is, what is the minimum concentration of an odor that your dog can detect? So we talk about thresholds a lot, right? So this is going to be, you know, how much odor needs to be coming off? And depending on exactly what your target is, you know, sometimes your dog is working well above threshold, so they're working at something that they could easily smell and is not close to their sort of perceptual limits. 
But in other times you're working sort of right at those perceptual limits, particularly with some explosives, particularly in situations where you have encapsulation or you have some type of container that's sealed, right? You're gonna really be looking at that trace side of things rather than those, uh, those higher concentrations. And the question is as well, how good is the dog's nose? And I, I sort of graph here is going through the scientific literature of the different studies that have been conducted uh, really over the past several decades of what we know about thresholds for the dog and sort of compare it to dog, human, mouse, and rat. And the quick thing to sort of point out here is that uh, the odors that are presented, so acetic acid, maybe you guys know what that one smells like, vinegar, if you're on the narcotic side, then possibly heroin, um, and malacetate, smells like bananas, butyric acid smells like, I don't know, disgusting, it's kind of sweaty smell, different kinds of fatty acids, uh, but, the, but the sort of quick uh, thing to note is that a lot of the things that we actually know the dog's threshold for have nothing to do with a lot of the things that we train dogs to find. Um, possibly acetic acid with heroin, but not too much off that. But when it comes directly to something like acetic acid, you can see this circle here is what the dog's threshold is. And this triangle here is what the human's threshold is. And this is where it gets a little bit interesting because we always here, and perhaps you've heard that the dog's nose is 10,000 times better than a human's nose, or perhaps a thousand times better than a human's nose. And the answer is, it depends. Because in this case, particularly with acetic acid, your nose is actually about as good as the dog's is. Uh, there's not too much differentiation there. However, if you look at something like amyl acetate, and you look at the dog down here and the human up here, this would suggest about a thousand to a 10,000 fold improvement over our sense of smell. So here for amyl acetate, that number of 10,000 is true. For acetic acid, it's completely not true. And then when it comes to butyric acid, there's really only less than a tenfold difference. When it comes to a caproic acid, there's about a hundred to a thousand fold difference. When it comes to formic acid, your nose is actually better than what's been tested for the dog's nose. So in that case, the answer of how good is the dog's nose is it actually really depends on what that particular target is. I think this is important to consider, to think about in the different areas that you're working because your particular target might be someone that the dog may not be particularly attuned to. What controls this is going to be a wide variety of sort of evolutionary and sort of learning factors. Um, but nonetheless, it does highlight that, you know, there are some times where your sense of smell and range is actually going to be relatively similar, similar to what the dogs very well could be. Oh, and then this little blue line here is I like to, uh, perhaps you've heard that the dog can detect one drop of something within uh, like a, an Olympic sized swimming pool. That's equivalent to about one part per trillion, which is where this little blue line is. Um, hopefully you can see, I'm gonna, whoops, give myself a red laser pointer so it's a little bit easier to see. This blue line here, is that one part per trillion or it's sort of that one drop of something in an Olympic sized swimming pool of water, which isn't true for acetic acid, but it is true for amyl acetate, isn't true for some of these odors. So again, a lot of the things that we like to use sort of off the cuff or offhand about the dog's sense of smell is actually really quite variable and, and not necessarily universally true. All right, so now another sort of fun question. Uh, when it comes to looking at the different animals that are out there and their sense of smell, where does the dog line up? Well, particularly within the sort of what we call the, the genetic repertoire of olfactory receptors, meaning the numbers of different types of olfactory receptors that they have. And we'll def sort of define, go deeper into what olfactory receptors are, but which species do you think uh, has the largest number of different kinds of olfactory receptors that detect odors? Is it A, dog, B, mouse, C, rat, or D, the elephant? I'll give you guys a second to think about it. And without, it wouldn't be easy to do a Zoom question here. So I'll just go ahead and take hands. How many of you think it's the dog? Take that as nobody. How about the mouse? One for mouse. Rat. Ooh, lots for rats. And the elephant? The four for elephant are correct. It's actually the elephant. So the elephant has over 2,000 different types 
um, of olfactory receptors that are coded for within their genome. Uh, the dog is going to be closer to uh, 900. So about a thousand less than would be the elephant. Us humans are at the feeble 600. Elephants are around the 2000. Rats are going to be quite close. So those of you who are the rat people were relatively close, not too far off. And the mouse is about 1200 to 1400. So in terms of where do the dogs lie in terms of this spectrum, they're actually closer to us, interestingly enough, than a lot of these other species. We'll talk about what this actually functionally means, which means that it could actually, and we'll talk about this in a second, it could mean functionally very little actually, but nonetheless, in terms of sort of where they lie in the spectrum, the dogs are actually going to be one of the closest animals to us in comparison to our mouse, rat, and elephant. Chickens, I think, have 52. So we're actually, we, we beat out chickens by a lot. So uh, because olfactory receptors are cross-reactive, there's a lot of arguments that maybe a lot of these are redundant. So sometimes the absolute number may not be that interesting of a comparison, but we'll talk about what that looks like in just a sec. Oh, and then I guess uh, one additional important thing is that uh, based off of sort of the, the latest research, it's estimated, obviously not tested empirically because a trillion is a lot, uh, but it's estimated that with just our 600 olfactory receptors, we could probably discriminate about a trillion different odors. So when we're just simply comparing numbers of 600 you know, to 900 to 1600, the question becomes is, well, how many trillions of odors are really needed to do what particular job that we're interested in? Um, so the entire question of, of just comparing numbers is actually a bit more complicated than we make it out to be. Another thing that you might have heard is that dogs have about 300 million sort of olfactory sensory neurons, uh, which is quite true. And in comparison to humans, that's only about 10 to 20 million. So, uh, you know, there's about uh, at least a 30-fold increase uh, in the number of olfactory sensory neurons uh, from us to our dogs. Interestingly enough, though, the mouse only has 10 million. So what does that mean? So I think a lot of times we make these simple number comparisons, and you probably see them a lot because they're easy to say and easy to put in paper, but actually what these mean in terms of how much better is the dog's nose than ours really we need behavioral data uh, or how much better is a dog's nose than a rat's nose or is it worse than a rat's nose? We actually need behavioral data to make those demonstrations because I think a lot of times we can trick ourselves into just simply looking and comparing a couple of numbers, but because we don't know exactly what that functionally means, it's actually really difficult to know, well, what do these differences between 300 million and 10 million mean if the mouse's performance is just as good with only 10 million? More or bigger is not necessarily always better in this case. All right, so what are olfactory receptors? A lot of times you'll see them shortened as OR or OR, just because that's a little bit easier, and that stands for olfactory receptors. So olfactory receptors are what detects the shape or features of an odor. So this is just a stick kind of drawing of what an odor looks like. And our olfactory receptors kind of have these little open nooks or crannies. It's not quite like a lock and key, but it is actually relatively similar. So your olfactory receptors will be kind of sticking out into your olfactory epithelium. So sort of that up and inside kind of part of your nose and they're sticking out and they're kind of making these odd little shapes or conformations. And odors are physical things and they kind of bounce in and come in and they have different shapes and configurations. And sometimes they will kind of fit well enough to activate a particular type of olfactory receptor. So it's all about sort of actual physical touching and shape interaction. So when you are, or your dog is smelling something, there is that physical chemical that is coming through the air, being sucked up by the nose and interacting with those olfactory receptors within the nose itself. The specificity of our olfactory receptors is really quite remarkable. And in fact, it actually makes it very difficult to be able to predict how an odor will smell necessarily just by how it looks. So one thing I like to use a lot is, you know, a lot of times when we get, particularly in the narcotics world, or sometimes in the explosives world, we'll say, well, these two chemicals are 
physically related to each other or they're similar to each other. So they must smell the same to the dog or the dog would easily generalize from one to the other because they're related like calcium ammonium nitrate and ammonium nitrate or a urea nitrate and ammonium nitrate, right? They're, they're related molecules. So the dog must sort of perceive them similarly. Well, here's an example just from with our own uh, sort of perception. And this is um, uh, an odorant we call carvone. There are two different versions of it. So there is the R version and the S version. If you look at these two molecules, the only difference between them is that they're mirror images of each other. So if I drew a line down here, this would basically just be the flip of this. And that's because there's this one carbon atom that's slightly rotated so that it just looks slightly different so that they're mirror images of each other. Same chemical formula, otherwise the same chemical makeup. One of these smells like mint. So you would have it mostly like a spearmint or something like an a spearmint candy. The other one smells like shoe leather. You would never confuse these two. They would never even be considered within the same scope. You would smell one and you'd be like, oh, this is an old shoe. You smell the other one and this is a spearmint gum, right? They're completely different, but the molecules themselves are actually chemically identical. So from this perspective, uh, the shape of the way different molecules fit actually can have a very dramatic impact on the way things are perceived, which means that a lot of times if we just say two chemicals are related, that might mean they smell similar, but it could mean that they smell almost nothing alike. Uh, and that's one of the sort of, I guess, fun things or complicated things uh, of olfaction. All right. I feel like I've been talking really, really fast. Any questions on that so far? Doesn't look like I've put you to sleep, but just wait, it's coming. All right. Um, so how do olfactory receptors work, given that I just told you sort of that uh, ridiculous specificity for the shape of certain molecules? So I'm just giving you a, a sort of a cartoon diagram of five olfactory receptors, olfactory receptor one, two, three, four, and five. And basically what olfactory receptors can do is they can either activate or not activate. So on versus off, on or off. So olfactory receptor one can be on or off, two could be on or off, three could be on or off, etc. So let's say we blow a particular odor across it like strawberry. And let's say that turns on olfactory receptor one, olfactory receptor three, because that strawberry molecule is able to bind to these two but it doesn't turn on two, four, or five. So the dog might see this and say, ah, that must mean strawberry because olfactory receptor one and three are on, two, four, and five are off. Now, if we blow a slightly different odor like a banana, say we activate two and say we also activate three. So three is activated by both the strawberry and banana here, but because two is activated and one is not, this produces a different type of code. So if you're into computer programming, this is kind of like its own binary code where each olfactory receptor has a zero or a one kind of position. So this code gives us banana and this code gives us strawberry. And we can look at a different odor like odor three that just activates olfactory receptor two. That produces a different code. And this would be a different code and this would be a different code. So just with five different types of olfactory receptors, we can easily produce a wide range of different codes based off of which olfactory receptors get activated or deactivated uh, dependent on the particular shape of that chemical that the dog is detecting. Oh, and here's six. So with just five different odor receptors alone, we have 32 possible codes. When I was telling you about the chicken before, right? And I was sort of making fun of the poor little chicken who only has 52 different types of olfactory receptors. Well, even with those 52, they can still do a lot. That's tens of thousands of different types of olfactory receptor codes. Oops. With our uh, 600, we can easily produce well over a trillion different kinds of olfactory receptor codes. And uh, our dog's 900 is in sort of well into the, beyond the quadrillion. So in other words, 
their olfactory receptor codes have enough resolution to essentially distinguish any type of odor out there. So then the question becomes is, well, how many of these are potentially redundant or doing the same thing or just slight modifications of them? So because of that, we really don't know what the number of say 900 for the dog and 1200 for the rat, or sorry, for the mouse and 14 to 1600 for the rat actually truly means in terms of their capabilities and differences in capabilities for us to be able to do that. But nonetheless, we do know that these olfactory receptors and some of the individual identities of these olfactory receptors differs genetically. So this can differ from one dog to another. And there has been some research that suggested that certain types of, of genetic olfactory receptors make some dogs better at narcotics and some dogs better at explosives detection. So in those cases, you know, the, the variation of that genetically can have important consequences. But the research on that is really quite minimal at this point. So it makes it difficult to make sort of more general extrapolations to say, you know, if you want a narcotics dog, you should get this kind of dog. We're not there yet by any means, but there does seem to be some evidence that variation within these olfactory receptors from a genetics perspective can have potential functional consequences in terms of how good the dog might be doing at one particular odor detection task over another. Okay. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about sniffing. So uh, you guys are probably well familiar with dog sniff, right? And that's how they detect things. Maybe it hasn't really struck you or you know, have, has noticed it as at all particularly interesting um, that dogs sniff, but very rarely do people sniff, right? Very rarely do you sort of go around into a room sniffing in the same way that dogs do. Why are dogs so into sniffing and what does it functionally do for them? I'm gonna show you some videos uh, that suggest that sniffing is actually a relatively important sort of component of dog detection. And it's something that if you're not paying attention to as a handler, is definitely something to start thinking about and potentially start paying attention to. So this is a video from this paper that's cited at the bottom over here. This is what a 3D printed dog nose. So it's not an actual dog. It's a nose that was pre sort of printed based off of a CT scan of a dog's nose. So basically in the same way that you can go in and sort of see kind of like an x-ray, it's a fancy type of scan to sort of look at, but what are the actual dimensions and structures of the dog's nose? And then what they did is that they added a little vacuum here to kind of make it sniff. And what they did is that they actually made it sniff at a similar way and frequency that a real dog does. And here is a canister with TNT in it. And this is using a fancy type of photography called Schlieren photography. If you're really into photography, Schlieren photography is definitely something really cool to look up into. It's basically a way of just sort of putting different camera lenses and different orientations that allow you to see the movement of air. So if you wanna sort of visualize odors, Schlieren photography is the way to do it. It's a lot of fun, but very difficult. But nonetheless, uh, so what they looked at is, well, what happens when you have your dog's nose here, you have your TNT here, and you actually make it sniff. So it's pulsing in the same way that a dog would sniff. Let me play that again. And what you can see is that by doing this, the dog is essentially entraining air from this source here that includes the explosive. And what they did is that they actually attached um, a, a chemical sensor, I think it was for TNT, a chemical sensor, and found that the sensor itself improved detection by essentially passing it through a system that was pulsing like a dog's nose does, indicating that sort of the structure of the dog's nose, but also the way that sniffing actually occurs can be a relatively important feature of, of detection in of itself. And this is a different way to uh, look at it using sort of uh, uh, high beam lasers and smoke. And this is comparing when a dog is just inhaling, so going to an actual sniff, which is a... So this is inhale. So what happens when the dog is inhaling versus sniffing? So just a general inhale. And now they're engaging in sniffing. And one of the things that hopefully that you can see is that the sniffing itself is actually creating a very important dynamic of the air around them, which is substantially changing sort of the amount of odor that is coming to the dog itself. The other thing to look at is sort of this 
these interesting sort of spindles and fibers. This is how odor actually really travels. It doesn't sort of travel in that concentration gradient or cone that we like to talk about. It actually is a very complex and dynamic and random system. So you can see here that there's gaps in the odor itself where there's no odor here, but then there's very concentrated spindles here. And then there's a super concentrated kind of spindle over here, which means that odor in of itself and the way that it behaves when it's moving is actually all the more fun and interesting than what we give it credit for. But nonetheless, at least physically, and in terms of the air that is being pulled in, it seems that sniffing versus just simply inhaling makes a big difference in the amount of air as well as the dynamics of the way that the odor behaves around uh, the dog itself. It entrains and pulls in more odor when the dog is sniffing versus when they are not sniffing. So we think that sniffing is a really important component. And that is largely on what I'd consider sort of the, the dynamics of the way odors move. There's another important reason or another sort of important component to dog sniffing in of itself is partially related to the frequency. So this is basically a little system that we set up that measures dog sniffing. So we can present a little odor inside of this box and while their nose is inside of this box, we can measure the airflow that's going on. So this is a dog that's basically just sniffing in, sniffing out, sniffing in, sniffing out, sniffing in, sniffing out. And we get sort of a nice rhythmic kind of frequency, which is about one breath, depending on sort of where you look from here to here, about every two seconds or about 0.5 Hertz. So once every two seconds. This is a similar graph, but if we present an odor, the dog sort of breathes in, not much happens, breathes out, breathes in, and then you get this kind of recognition. We get this really quick high bandwidth of sniffing. And this sniffing bandwidth can go up to seven Hertz or about seven times per second. So within one second, the dog can be breathing in and breathing out between five to seven times, which is incredibly fast, right? That's something that's very hard for us to even physiologically do. The dog has the physiological mechanisms that allow them to do this. And one of the sort of reasons for this is the video that I just showed you. It helps move odor around in your environment. But secondly, is that we think that there's an important psychological phenomenon that allows the dog to be sensitive to small changes in their odor environment. And we call that change blindness. So let's do a little fun kind of video to demonstrate this psychological phenomenon uh, playing with ourselves. Can you guys see this black video right now on the side of the screen? All right, presumably you guys have played this game before about find the difference. So here are two different pictures and your goal here is to look at, well, what's different between this picture and this picture? So right now I can already see one, you know, there's a girl over here versus a girl over here. This basket is over here versus the basket being over here. Uh, this basket is there, whoops, versus over there. Anyway, so let's do that exact same game but we're gonna be a human for 10 seconds and then be a dog for 10 seconds. So let's start with the human sniffing, which is our typical 0.5 Hertz or one sample every two seconds. So I'm gonna ask you to find as many differences as you possibly can, but you're going to be sampling those two pictures just like you would sample from a human perspective of, of um, sniffing a room when you come into a new room, which is you sort of walk in, and you breathe regularly, which is about once every two, uh, two seconds. All right. So be prepared. Now the second picture, what were the differences? Okay. Oh, there we go. So that was 10 seconds. How did you do? How many of you found one difference? How many of you found two differences? Okay, let's try the other way. How many of you found zero differences? <laughs> Most of you. How many of you found three differences? Almost nobody, right? So you guys are somewhere between zero to one. Don't worry, that's quite typical for, my, for, for the audience. That's not uh, particularly bad. But we're gonna do the exact same thing, but now we're gonna pretend to be a dog. I'm gonna show you the exact same two pictures, but now at five hertz or five samples per second.
Okay. How many of you again still found zero differences? One, two, three, four. I don't think there were more than four, but as you can see, hopefully you guys saw, there was a substantial increase in the number of differences that were observed. That video length was the exact same 10 seconds. So that first round of 10 seconds was the exact same as that second round of 10 seconds. The only difference is that I increased your sample rate or the frequency by which you were getting those pictures. So that's the difference of you walking into a room or your dog walking into a room and just breathing regularly versus walking in and sniffing at five hertz, <laughs> which is very hard to do, I guess, or communicate via Zoom. But anyway, nonetheless, the, the point is, is that um, the psychological phenomenon is what we call change blindness. And this is that phenomenon that if there is some gap that is longer than fractions of a second between getting one sample and the next sample, we're actually really bad at being able to make those comparisons. When I gave you that first picture, right, where there were two pictures back to back, it didn't seem like that was such a case, right? Because you would look at the first picture and then look at the second picture. But your eyes can move fast enough that they're going up and down, up and down, up and down at a frequency that allows you to make those comparisons very easily. To make that same game very difficult is if I were to simply put a page between those two pictures, which is what I basically did with the first demonstration, that makes it much harder to actually participate and, and sort of complete that game. But if I give you an opportunity to make those comparisons back and forth very quickly, like the dog can when they are sniffing, then it becomes much more easily sort of discernible when there are differences or changes in the room. So we think that navigation, tracking, those kinds of things are going to be highly dependent on making those kind of sniffing differentiations because you can compare what something smells like right now to what it smelled like less than a fifth of a second ago when you're sampling at five, five hertz. But if you're just sampling at once every two hertz or once every two seconds, it's very difficult to make those comparisons. So the importance of the dog in engaging in active sniffing seems to be a very important critical feature about the differentiation in terms of performance that you might expect under some conditions where the dog is not in active sniffing versus conditions where the dog is in active sniffing. All right, we're back to another black slide, which means I can take a break and have a sip of coffee. Any questions on this so far? Still awake? Yep. All right. So now the next question is a bit of a fun one because I love, every, I love all the opinions that sort of come out. And this was, a, this was actually just a fun little experiment we did a long time ago, but um, it was really just a, um, it was a simple little thing with some uh, fun results. And one of the things that we came across uh, was that there's relatively sort of limited ranges of breeds that are used a lot of times for uh, detection work. I would say recently that's changing. You know, springers are becoming more popular. Um, a variety of different types of, of hunting breeds are becoming more popular, but for a while, it was limited to a handful of different kinds of dogs. Oh, here's my second joke. So let's look at the lab results. Uh, anyway, uh, okay. So in terms of just a simple kind of fun question, of these different kinds of, of dogs, uh, German Shepherd, our uh, Mals, and our Labradors, uh, or I don't know, uh, which is in your opinion, sort of the best dog for detection work. And what I mean specifically for this, I guess would be their sense of smell, their, their sort of thresholds and capability limits to be able to learn some type of detection task. Would you vote for either A, German Shepherds? All right, only a handful of Shepherds. Malinois? Nobody likes the Malinois. All right, one Mal. Labs? All right, we got a group for the labs. Was there one that I left out on that is insulting? Springers, no. I don't know. There you go. Uh, the one that I vote for is actually, I don't know. 
And the answer, and, and quite truly, I don't know. And the answer is that there's been very little data that has been out there. But of course, you know, Mr. Google or Dr. Google has no problem giving you lots and lots of different answers. So there's plenty of articles that if you go out there and search would be the 10 dog breeds with the best sense of smell. The one that I guess I forgot to put on there, but perhaps maybe you guys would have on there. The bloodhound comes up over and over and over again. Actually, I, I don't know. Are, are bloodhounds frequently used in, in Australia? No, really not. No, yeah. I think historically the bloodhound is actually a very American thing of like the late 1800s. But nonetheless, people talk about bloodhounds all the time. They have a particular reputation. Second would be the German Shepherd. Uh, that one sort of always comes up as the number two with the best sense of smell. But again, these are all just coming out from sort of random, random articles that people are putting out. Um, some of them potentially from surveys. When it actually comes to data, what data has been collected out there, there's actually very, very little. One of the first things uh, that was collected was actually in the late 70s. Uh, and this was a project that was sort of uh, in concurrency um, or particularly coming about during the Vietnam War because uh, the use of dogs for detection of explosives and, and, and booby traps at that time was really growing and becoming uh, more popular. So they commissioned a set of different kinds of studies that was down in San Antonio, Texas to look at different types of breeds of dogs, but actually a wide variety of different kinds of animals for the use as a detection animal to potentially detect uh, different types of landmines, explosives, and booby traps. They were looking specifically about uh, buried landmines in this experiment. So they had uh, only a handful of different subjects, but they trained an Australian dingo. So we got a dingo in here, a coyote, a silver fox, catamundang, domestic pigs, uh, mini pigs, ferrets, javelinas, raccoons, and skunks. Skunk was actually pretty good, believe it or not. Um, and, the, and the dingo was too. Um, but nonetheless, the, the things that they found or the overall summaries from this is that a wide variety of animals were relatively decent, overall sort of 75% or higher in terms of accuracy except the raccoon. The raccoon was a bit of a pain in the butt to train, apparently. Um, but nonetheless, in terms of all of the different animals, the one that was able to detect the landmines at the greatest depth was actually the pigs. Uh, the pigs were, were, were sort of the winners in that case. Uh, there was two reasons why they abandoned uh, Project Pig. Uh, one was if you ever sort of work with pigs and you do a lot of food-based reward, you find that they have this kind of Pavlovian response to root after they have found something that's been associated with food. So during a landmine excavation or a landmine search, that was a really bad situation to have your pig sort of find your target odor and start rooting. Uh, so that was one reason, but that one was actually uh, trainable and not too bad. The second biggest issue, or at least so that they said, was actually an image issue. They found it too ludicrous essentially to have to the concept of, of, of deploying uh, pigs for landmine detection. So that's the reason why sort of the, the pig was eliminated there. But nonetheless, they tested a wide range of dogs. So they had beagles, border collies, English sheepdogs, German shepherds, Labrador retrievers, uh, elk hounds, rabbit hounds, Rhodesian Ridgeback, and they had a corgi available for some reason. But nonetheless, the sort of dogs that performed the best uh, was essentially relatively all of them, the beagle did well, so did the border collie and the English sheepdog. The two dogs or the two animals that performed the worst that they had the most numbers of was the German shepherd and the Labrador retriever. Uh, so then the question becomes, well, why were they, why did they use so many of them or why did they then sort of after collecting this data start deploying them so frequently? And the answer was is because they were already in use uh, for, you know, for a variety of different types of working dog purposes. So they were sort of already available and ready to go. But nonetheless, uh, it was sort of an, an interesting data set uh, that had kind of come up from that. There have been a couple of studies of behavioral research, um, some of it doing mostly surveys of dog handlers. Uh, and the ultimate conclusion that's come from the surveys of dog handlers is that everybody loves their dog, whatever breed it is, um, which is probably because you spend so much time you know, working and training and absolutely loving your dog. So everyone just sort of rates their dog as the best dog out there. So in terms of are there breed differences from that perspective, the answer is largely no. So if you survey people, there aren't too many. 
there was a recent assessment um, that was done in Poland that compared uh, German Shepherd dogs, Labradors, and Terriers, um, and found that the German Shepherds did slightly better than the Labs or Terriers, but there were some um, sort of uh, conflicting things. One is that it was different target odors, and other is that there were different groups of people training the different dogs, um, so it made it makes it a bit difficult to sort of draw those conclusions uh, more generally, uh, but at least within their sort of police dog program, uh, the German Shepherds did slightly better. So one thing that we did a few years ago uh, was look at the simple question as is, well, can we sort of establish very simple breed differences? Can we collect some data on 30 different dogs and establish if there are performance differences in sort of how quickly the dogs will learn to do a detection task, how sensitive they are. So if we dilute the target odor, how sensitive they are to lower concentrations of that odor, and then compare that to an arbitrary training task to make sure that what we're seeing are differences related to their actual sense of smell and not related to different, different types of visual differences per se, or, or differences in their overall cognitive capabilities or differences in just their motivation levels. So we picked the German Shepherd because where we were, there just happened to be lots of German Shepherds that were available. Then we picked the worst dog we could potentially think of, which was the pug. So we thought, well, if we're going to you know, do this study, let's find differences immediately you know, to establish that there are differences. So we'll find you know, our prototypical dog and compare that to probably the worst dog out there. If you love pugs, I mean, I love pugs too, but from a detection perspective, perhaps you'd imagine that they wouldn't be great. And we compared that to a more traditional sight hound. We were in Florida at the time, and there was a lot of uh, racetracks in Florida. So greyhounds were of, of lots and lots of availability as pet dogs in our local community. So what we did is that we took 10 of each of these th different types of dogs. So it was a total of 30 different dogs and we trained them on a simple odor discrimination. So basically uh, here are two different boxes, which one has your target odor? So we did this, um, in a standardized procedure so that all of the trials were counted. So there was no sort of extra, you know, training that was going for one dog versus another. And it was a standard protocol that we were able to follow with all of the dogs. So we trained them each using the same procedure and we measured, well, how long did it take each dog to learn the task? How well and successful were they? Then we diluted the target odor by 10 and 1% to sort of look at how well they perform when we diluted it to lower concentrations. And then we did a control discrimination, which was a simple visual discrimination. And the idea for that is that if there were differences between say just the overall cognitive capabilities of our German shepherds versus our pugs, then we would expect the German shepherds to beat the pugs, both in learning how quickly to do the odor detection task, the sensitivity, and that they would also do better at an arbitrary task. So it wasn't about their, their nose per se, it was just say they're smarter. Or we could say that the German Shepherds were more you know, uh, motivated to engage in the task than were the pugs or the greyhounds. This was a simple bucket challenge. So they really had two choices. We set it up this way because it helped increase uh, the, you know, the probability of getting a correct answer uh, and learning the task. So here we just used an arbitrary odor. So we had a standard two choice procedure and we trained each dog for four sessions. Then after we trained the dogs to the target odor, we diluted the target odor for two sessions. And then we gave them a simple visual discrimination, big cup versus small cup. And the idea was if you know, the German Shepherds were just smarter, they would do all three better than with the pugs or the greyhounds. So what is the actual data? So here is 50% line, which is two choices. So this is a chance when they first started off. And the German Shepherds started off at chance because they didn't know the target odor. But by the end of four sessions, we were at about 80% accuracy overall. So they learned it relatively quickly. Four sessions was 20 minutes. So in four 20 minute sessions, the dogs were performing uh, above 80%. The individual circles here were the greyhounds. The greyhounds dropped out pretty quick. They preferred to be couch potatoes. So this wasn't anything about their nose. They just didn't necessarily want to participate uh, in the particular task. So then the question is, is ultimately, well, how much slower were the pugs? And this is the pug performance. They were actually substantially and unexpectedly faster. Even at day one, they were in the 60s to 70s percent. But by day four, all of the pugs 
were between 95 to 100 percent. At the same time point, the German shepherds were still were still sort of messing about at around 80 percent. Uh, the pugs at first, when we first got this data, we were shocked. We were like, "This must be wrong. There's no way that this is the case." We went back and double checked all the dogs' names. I watched the video, uh, and this was the case. The pugs were absolute rock stars on that. Then we thought, well. Maybe they just learned it faster, but what happens when we dilute the odor, right? If we dilute the odor a little bit, uh, then perhaps, you know, this is where the German shepherds would shine and the pugs would sort of tank quite hard. So here's the 100%. So this is basically where they were when we left them at training. And then when we dilute it by 10%, there's a decrease. When we dilute it down to 1%, there's a bit of a decrease, but they're still performing above chance. Our greyhounds, on the other hand, are we're down to just one greyhound who's participating. So the greyhounds were a bit of a bust. So now your question is, well, what about the pugs? And this is the pug performance. When we diluted by 10%, there was absolutely no change in performance. They rocked it uh, sort of across the board. When we diluted it down to 1%, they were still well outperforming the German shepherds on this, which again, sort of shocked us. So at this point, we were like, okay, something is going on a little bit crazy here. Maybe we just don't know the difference between a pug and a German shepherd. But one thought was, is you've never really seen a skinny pug, right? Pugs like food. A lot of the motivation that we were using here, we did preference tests for all the different dogs and the dogs all uh, had preferences for the food, but maybe a pug's preference for food is just so much better than a German shepherd's and that might have been what some of that differentiation was. So the, that's where our control discrimination comes in hand. So here, if it was just purely motivation, right, that the German Shepherds weren't motivated, but the pugs were, then we would expect this same difference in performance. The pugs would outperform the German Shepherds. And this would tell us that these differences have nothing to do with the nose, but it just means that the pugs were hungrier, if you will, hungrier for the data. So here is the performance across the visual discrimination. We had a couple of greyhounds back. The German Shepherds learned it. We're above 80% again. Uh, doing sort of what they do and did a pretty good job. And here were the pugs. They're absolutely spot on identical. So when it came to a visual discrimination, there's absolutely no difference between these 20 dogs. However, when it was an uh, ascent discrimination, we had a really big differentiation. So this was really quite baffling to us because one, you know, what's going on with the pugs? And two, don't get me wrong, the takeaway of this is not for you all to change in your dog for pugs and sort of to have a huge demand for pugs, right? There's a wide variety of reasons why the pug is a terrible choice for a detection dog. Um, but nonetheless, what this does highlight is some of the unexpected results that can come out of these kinds of things when you actually just test it. Um, sometimes we sort of make these assumptions that there's going to be these differentiations or we come up with arguments about the length of the nose versus the short of, you know, how short the nose is. Uh, and come up with these justifications about why this dog would have a better sense of smell, but very rarely do we ever test it. And we had this really interesting kind of case here. The one thing that we did notice anecdotally is that while there didn't seem to be much difference in terms of overall motivation uh, because of our visual control, we did notice that the pugs sniffed a lot more. They were also a little bit closer to the ground. They were closer to the ground and they sniffed a lot and they were doing a ground kind of search between the different buckets. So my best guess is that that was the primary differentiator is that they were engaged more in active sniffing and they're lower to the ground, easier for them to be engaged in active sniffing in the different buckets. Whereas it took the German shepherds a little bit more time to sort of figure out what it was that they were searching and that they were doing something using their sense of smell. But nonetheless, the conclusions here is that a lot of times we had a lot of untested you know, assumptions that come with us because someone said something or because you know, we just noticed that you know, one type of dog is used more frequently than another, but we should actually challenge these assumptions when we get the chance. And particularly, you know, think about uh, you know, the dog in front of us and not necessarily trying to select or, or saying that one particular dog is the right type of dog based on their sense of smell uh, alone because we just don't actually have that information. Okay, questions on that little fun kind of ludicrous study. Nathan, was there any research done that you know of? Um, you spoke about minimum thresholds in relation to a dog entering an environment that might be like have a paint, an overwhelming paint smell. 
at what stage do you know if you've got past humility in that environment if the dog's ability to find and take that? Does that make sense? Uh, to some degree, but I think it was actually because I'm having trouble hearing you. So my audio is coming through this little phone, which is why I'm sort of hitting my head down here. Could you say that one more time or possibly get a little bit closer to the microphone? Ah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you move so much. No, all good. I was saying um, you said there was a bit of work done with minimum thresholds for dogs. Yes. Um, in relation to a dog entering an environment that might be have an overwhelming paint or cannabis smell, has there been any research done where it shows that the dog's ability to detect a target odor in that environment diminish? Ah, great question. Okay, so now let's go to the next slide. <laughs> yes, we actually have that exact same situation. That's a perfect question. And it's almost like I planted you to, to ask that question right at this right time. Um, Okay, so then it comes to the question is, is concentration important? Uh, and the, the anecdotal evidence, and perhaps maybe you've experienced this before, is that anecdotally, there, you know, we do think that there's importance in, in terms of concentration. Uh, uh, Mallory, Dr. Deshant is going to be talking about sort of that generalization to on the low side, which you just noted. Uh, but I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about an opposite kind of finding that we found on the high side. Uh, so there had been anecdotal reports, you know, so I've been told that dogs will find, I don't know if you guys use the term dime bags, but very small amounts of marijuana, but will let a semi truck go through or very small amounts of cocaine, but will let an entire truck full of that same substance go past without alerting. Uh, and there have been situations, you know, for in search and rescue or cadaver situations, there's a mass casualty event, but a lot of times the dogs might even just look confused where you might have these situations of really high amounts of odor. And I also have a really odd picture over here of two cups of coffee in mason jars. Uh, we're weird and we drink out of mason jars for some reason. I, I guess my wife thinks it's cool. But nonetheless, I have two pictures here. Uh, one is at about four ounces. The other is about two ounces. Which one of these cups gives off more odor, do you think? Sorry. Is it this one on the left or the one on the right? It says left, right? How about neither? Oh, there you go. You guys must have already had, you guys are, are well informed. Yeah, so either of these actually give off the exact same amount in theory. Uh, and the reason because of that is that the actual thing that's controlling the concentration coming off of this is the surface area of this opening and not the actual quantity that's inside of here. So uh, filling it up to four ounces versus two ounces isn't actually going to be substantially changing uh, your overall odor. Oh, hello, sorry. Sorry, the um, speaker's changed. Ah, no worries. I just had to look over and you scared me there. <laughs> Can you say something? Say hello, Nate. Hello, testing, testing. Did you lose me? Samsung. Samsung, yeah. But I hooked into it through the Bluetooth. Oh, Bluetooth. Oh, gosh. I think you got to minimize the whole thing to get in there. This your computer. Yeah. Is yeah. Can you do it? Because yeah. I have not turned off from the Bluetooth yeah. yeah. anymore. It's a lot. Give us just a sec, Nathan. Yep, no problem. Oh, that's good. Oh, 
Nathan, can you go ahead and say hello? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. We're just not on the right speaker. Everything was going fine. Yeah, I don't know what I did. There's all that talk about pugs, I think. The, I guess so, I guess I just broke the system. It could be. It's connected, I can hear. All right, can can you still hear us, Nathan? I can hear you, can you hear me? I can, but we just got you on the wrong. Would it be helpful if I disconnected and tried again? Do you think that would? No, it's, it's definitely on our end. It's not your fault at all. All right, one more time. Testing, testing. There we go. Perfect. All right. I will get out of the way and let you continue. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. Well. All right, so both of these two uh, sources would give off, in theory, the same concentration of odor because what's controlled is sort of the size of the opening here and not actually the quantity that's inside of here. So a lot of times we think that we're training on higher quantities by simply filling our container a little bit more, but that's actually not the case. Both of these would be giving off similar amounts, which is why weight in of itself is a pretty poor measurement um, of concentration. But nonetheless, I'm going to give you an example of which very weight was used. Um, so there, uh, uh, Deschant has a couple of different studies on that, and I'll be talking about a slightly different one. Um, but nonetheless, there are a couple of interesting sort of phenomena that do occur with odors. One is that, you know, when you have low concentrations versus high concentrations, the dog may simply just not recognize that high concentration may also be a target if they're used to trying to smell something at very, very low concentrations. But there's actually another phenomenon that's really interesting is that odor quality can actually change when you have substantial changes in concentration. Sometimes if you have over a hundred fold change in concentration, you'll actually get an odor quality difference. So here's an example of indole and in trace concentrations, it smells like jasmine. So if you like white flowery smells uh, like jasmine, gardenia, uh, that sort of light floral smell, I really like it. Uh, in trace concentrations, this indole will smell like that. And it's actually a really important component in a lot of diff different types of perfumes. Well, let's say, for example, you're a perfumer and you're like, I want to make this indole last forever. So I'm going to make a really high concentration of it. I'm going to extract it and put it at, say, a 40% concentration, which is substantially higher than what you would smell it in a flower. And let's put it on a perfume and, and see what people and, you know, think of it. But at really high concentrations, this exact same molecule smells like feces. It has a particular characteristic that makes it like feces. So you either have white flower smell at low concentrations, at high concentrations, it smells like shit, quite literally. Um, it's, it's one of those sort of interesting molecules and it's not uh, unique across the odor world, if you will. Uh, there are a variety of different molecules that will actually change their perceptual quality depending on sort of their actual concentration at which they are presented. So then the question is, is does this matter for any of our detection dogs? Uh, so here was a case study that we recently published um, in which we argue that it does. Uh, so this was an actual real life situation. So that's why it was considered a case study uh, where there was a, a bag that was found in the woods sort of near the edge of a tree line. And it was sort of suspicious, you know, what, what is this sort of odd bag doing there? So uh, the agency deployed uh, two of their dogs, explosives dogs, to go in and sniff it out and figure out what was going on. So they brought dog one up 
Dog one sniffed at it, walked away. Dog two comes up, sniffed at it, doesn't alert, walks away. So the bag was considered all clear. Oh, so dog one goes and sniffs, dog two goes and sniffs. Bag's considered all clear. Uh, however, there was 13 kilograms of ANFO inside of the bag. So ammonium nitrate fuel oil mixture. So for those of you that don't work explosives, this is a homemade explosive that was sitting inside of the bag. So about 30 pounds of it um, or 13 kilograms of it. So I got a call one day sort of saying, okay, uh, I, I've, uh, there are some people that are kind of trying to understand why this might have happened. Uh, you know, how could our dogs who are trained on ANFO and do really well on ANFO and certify on ANFO, how did they just, how did two of them just walk 13 kilograms of ANFO? And uh, he, they called me sort of at this time that I was doing a different uh, set of experiments that was showing a couple of different types of results. And I was like, well, there are a couple of different way, you know, reasons, you know, I do the normal scientific thing of I hum and I haw and say, it could be this, it could be that. But we, we talked about it for a little bit and we're like, well, can you get the explosive back? Can we do some research on it? And he said, I don't know, let's see. And uh, a couple of weeks later says, all right, we've got one day to figure out what happened. Uh, and we did. So we, we set up a set of different, three different experiments to try and test what happened. And I'll walk you through this. Uh, so we had limited access uh, for one day to 13 kilograms of this explosive. An interesting sort of background is that because of a variety of health and safety regulations, uh, they were only ever allowed to train on 30 grams of ANFO. So they weren't allowed to train on large amounts of ANFO, but the dogs were certified on 30 grams of it. And what we found was 13 kilograms. So thousands of times greater than what the dogs were normally trained on. So experiment one was we came up with this idea is that, well, maybe it had nothing to do with the different sizes of odor. Maybe it was that, you know, very rarely do you ever train to deploy a dog to a single bag at the edge of the woods. Maybe that was just a weird situation and the dogs didn't even sort of realize that they were working or detecting or, or supposed to be doing something in that case. So they just failed to search that bag thoroughly enough. Our second idea was that, well, maybe the, the laboratory says it's ANFO, but ANFO can be made up with a variety of different types of fuel oil. There can be different types of things that are added to it to make it um, uh, less water susceptible. So perhaps it was just an unusual version of ANFO and that's why the dogs didn't alert to it. And the third hypothesis was that this was just so much more ANFO than what they normally train on and that that was actually the cause that the dog didn't recognize this as a target because they're used to only finding 30 grams of this particular substance. So experiment one is uh, we got them to get the same 13 kilogram explosive and we found a little area that was a clearing and some trees that was similar to the actual situation and put out one bag and the dog would have to go out to that bag and alert or not alert. So one of them was a 13 kilogram explosive. Another one was a similar bag stuffed with newspaper. Another one was a similar bag stuffed with newspaper. Another one was a similar bag stuffed with newspaper and 30 grams of the ANFO that they normally train on. So the idea was if this was about just a weird situation, then the dog should not alert on any of these cases, right? This would suggest that it's just a weird gap in training that they just weren't used to going out and looking at an individual bag. Uh, if the dogs, if there was something about the bag or the odor itself, then we would suggest that the dogs wouldn't alert to the 13 kilograms, but should alert to the 30 gram training sample that they were normally trained on. This would indicate that it had nothing to do with the context, but that it's 100% to do with the odor. We don't know what about the odor, but we know it's something to do with the odor in this sort of 13 kilogram bag. So uh, what did the results show? This was the 13 kilograms of the confiscated material. Detection rates were around 28%. So one, we kind of replicated the real world situation. Essentially the dogs didn't alert again uh, to the same kind of sample. However, when we had the 30 gram sample, we had a 100% alert rate. Every dog alerted to their 30 gram training sample in the bag at the edge of the woods. And then the false positive rate was basically the same as the 13 kilogram sample. So meaning that there was real no detection or differentiation between the 13 kilograms of the AMFO versus their training sample. And the training sample was 100%. So we know that it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with the bag being at the edge of the woods. That was not the problem. 
So that hypothesis is eliminated. So then we went on to uh, sort of experiment number two to see, well, maybe it was just an unusual substance so the dogs failed to alert. So then we basically took the sample out uh, from the explosive itself, did a five choice lineup. This is just a picture of a dog and different choices. Uh, and we did two trials to detect the 30 grams of a normal training sample and two trials to detect 30 grams of the subsample of the explosive. So we actually took the material itself from the 13 kilograms and pulled out 30 grams of that and put it in a lineup. And we didn't reinforce responses to it. So if the dog alerted to it, we just called the dog off and moved again. So this was to not reinforce them to alerting to this particular sample in this case. And we did the same with their 30 grams of normal sample to kind of make that comparison. So what we found is that first, the training sample on trial one and trial two was 100%. The dogs alerted 100% to their training sample. When we gave them a 30 gram subsample of that actual explosive that was found, alert rates were about 75% to 80%. So most dogs alerted at least one time, several dogs alerted both times on the two trials, and there was, uh, I think, only, only a couple of dogs that only alerted on one of the two trials. And again, they weren't necessarily being reinforced. So this does indicate that there was some decrement because of the material itself. And later laboratory analysis actually indicated that there was uh, a material that was added to prevent it from um, uh, being sensitive to water, a, a different type of gel additive. So it was actually a little bit different than the training material itself. But nonetheless, a detection rate or a hit rate of 75%, the probability that two dogs with a hit rate of 75% would both clear the same sample was actually, it actually works out to like a 2% probability. Meaning that if this situation were replicated and there was actually only 30 grams of the subsample, there should have been an alert in the real world in that case. So this suggests that there is a decrement because of the material itself but not as much as what we saw because a second ago we saw detection rates in the 20%. So I give this one a bit of a yellow. It's not quite incorrect, but it's also not quite correct. So then we did experiment three to actually try and look at, well, what is that differentiation between the large quantity versus the small quantity itself? So here the dogs were trained uh, after on the five choice lineup. So using that simple five choice lineup, and the dogs that showed a performance decrement here, we trained them explicitly and reinforced them to this 30 gram subsample until every dog was at 100% alert rate. So they were alerting 100% to this specific chemical formulation of that explosive. Then we essentially gave them a lineup with three different bags. One bag had 13 kilograms of that same explosive that they just demonstrated 100% proficiency at for 30 grams of it, and two blanks. On the first trial, the alert rate was about 40%. So even after they just showed proficiency to 100% detection, uh, 30 grams of that explosive, they alerted only about 40% of the time to the correct bag on that first trial. However, because this was the last end, we started reinforcing it. Within three trials, the dogs were about 85%. So they very, very quickly just within three runs showed an increase in performance indicating that it probably smells somewhat similar, but we did not get that spontaneous generalization even though their performance was 100% on that exact same 30 gram subsample. So to us, this indicates that there very well can be uh, relevant and operational generalization failures, particularly when you have something that is at a substantially higher concentration than what the dog is necessarily trained to. Whether this re sort of reflects, uh, I guess, fund fundamental aspects of the dog that we kind of talk about when we're talking about low thresholds, or whether this is simply a, uh, a, a, uh, a recognition or a generalization failure where the odors smell similar, but they just don't recognize to alert to these high concentrations, uh, or simply the odor smells different when it's at a really high concentration than at a small concentration, we don't quite know that differentiation, but we do know that it's actually really important to include or find ways to include sort of these high concentration finds as part of uh, the, the sort of the training, uh, the training steps if we expect the dogs to necessarily find them uh, based off of this. So 
Does that does that sort of answer uh, the question you were posing uh, earlier at the beginning of this, or is that slightly different? Yeah, thanks, Nathan. It's slightly different. If I can, if I set the scenario, so I'm searching an area with my bomb dog. Okay. And I let him go into, say, a paint store where there might be some spilled paint and that sort of stuff. Uh -huh. but, there's also, but there's also a target odor in there at the end of the store. Does the dog's um, discrimination ability be over, become overwhelmed by the paint? And has there been any research at what parts per million for different substances that occurs, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, okay. So I, I think I get uh, your question a little bit more now. So. Um, <clears throat> so there was a study uh, that was done a while ago. So this one wasn't my study, um, but this was looking at extraneous odor. So basically you're running the dog where you have your target, non-target, target, non-target, non and the dog has to indicate where the target is. But then you sort of add in this irrelevant odor on the top of it, uh, or this extraneous odor. And can the dog still find the target versus no target? And they can with training. Um, the sort of amount of background odor to target odor is not that those parameters are not quite certain. So I can't say that, uh, you know, if you have a target, your background can't be more than, you know, a hundredfold more than your target. That's not known yet. Um, but it is known that you can have sort of extraneous odor mixed in there and the dogs be able to still be able to find that. That's also a bit of a caveat to that is how related is your background to your target. So if your background and your target are very similar perceptually, that actually makes it very, very difficult. But if they are not similar perceptually, then it's actually not too difficult. So you can kind of think about it of, of I go back to food for humans because that's really where we use our sense of smell a lot. You know, if I added a little bit of vinegar to your tea, right? You could have a lot more tea and just a little bit of drop of vinegar and that's pretty easy to detect if you just sniff it in a way, right? Uh, but if I added, uh, I guess, red wine vinegar into white wine vinegar, then that would be harder to detect because you know they're both very similar in terms of their backgrounds. Um, to what situations would that come up in real life? I'm not necessarily certain, um, but nonetheless, the dogs can have can still work through those kinds of problems, but it can have an effect. And the degree and magnitude of the effect of sort of how concentrated your target is to the background is going to depend on how similar those odors are. So if you're working with very similar types of odors, um, then very little extraneous odor might have a more detrimental effect than, a, uh, than would be something that are two completely different uh, types of, of odors. And with that, we'll talk about odor mixtures. <clears throat> so odor mixtures are again, sort of another complicated kind of thing in particular, and we'll talk about this in the situation of, of homemade explosives where you have, say for example, your ammonium nitrate that's going to be mixed with potentially fuel oil or sugar or any variety of different types of things. So uh, one of the first things I wanna sort of highlight is get back to sort of the basics of psychology. And this is, uh, getting to sort of what I call the idiosyncrasy with compound stimuli. So compound stimuli are when there are multiple kind of components to pay attention to. So let's say, for example, I give you these two items, right? I have this item over here, and I have this item over here. I tell you that this is correct, and this one is wrong. So this is your correct stimulus. Now I give you this stimulus. How many of you think this is a correct stimulus? How many of you think it's an incorrect stimulus? All right, lots of non-participation. I guess some of you don't necessarily know. So the answer is it's ambiguous. And a lot of times what you get is a split. Some people will say it's correct. Some people will say it's incorrect. And turns out if you ask animals, and in this case, it was a pigeon, one pigeon would pay attention to the difference of shape, the triangle versus the circle. Whereas the other pigeon pays attention to the color. So when you give something that is a compound stimulus, it's not unusual that the animals will be sort of taking in the whole thing and they might pay attention to one component over another component. So this is just a picture of a lineup and you can imagine that in this case, right? 
there are lots of different things that the dog could be paying attention to. It could be the material that's in there. It could be the fact that there's PVC mixed in with it. There could be things that are sort of overlapping with that or different kinds of mesh. There's a lot of different things that are what we call compound stimuli, things that are also sort of co-occurring with your target. So what do they pay attention to? The answer is it could all depend on the individual and it might differ from one dog to the other. But that doesn't mean that we've lost all control. There is a way that we can control this. And in fact, in this original experiment with the pigeon, the important takeaway is, is that you can tell the pigeon, I want you to pay attention to the triangle or I want you to pay attention to the color. And you do this by just giving them multiple different types of what we call examples or exemplars. So with multiple exemplar training, not only do they I give them the example of this is a target, but also this is a target, and this is a non-target, and this is a non-target, it becomes much clearer, right, that I want you to pay attention to color and not shape. But if I gave you these two as targets and these as non-targets, then it becomes very clear that I'm asking you to pay attention to the shape and not the color. So you can control what they pay attention to by basically giving them just many different types of examples where you vary the non-important or extraneous background while maintaining the target that is relevant or the cue that you want them to pay attention to is always consistent. So here, the shape is always the triangle versus here, the color is always correct. So now we can add just even a little bit more complexity uh, to the whole scenario because odors don't just act like a uh, visual stimulus or visual stimuli. They can act in, in two different kinds of ways. The first way is what we call elemental. So let's say I have red paint and I have green paint and I swirl it together and I can swirl it together like this such that you can see at the same time that there is red and there is green here being swirled together. What odors like to do though, is what we call configural processing. I take the same red, I take the same green, I mix them together and I get yellow. You notice how you see no red and you see no individual green in this, in this sort of configural processing. And this elemental processing you do. And where this kind of gets back to is sort of that, that stew theory of dogs that you say, you know, you smell something as a mixture or something configural, the dog smells it as elemental. And uh, the take home away from that is, if you smell something configural, your dog probably does too, uh, unless you specifically train them. Um, and one of the sort of examples of this is that for bees, humans, rodents, and rabbits, and practically every species tested, although we haven't done dogs yet, but that'll be a fun experiment to come, is if you take an odor or a particular chemical that smells like strawberries, and another particular chemical that smells like caramel, and I mix them together, what do you think you're going to get? How many of you said pineapples? Nobody, I guess. So unless any of you guessed particularly pineapples, it produces a pineapple sensation. It's like you're having pina coladas. Uh, so you can take strawberry caramel and make pineapples with by making that particular mixture. This is an example of configural processing in humans and it also works in bees, it also works in rodents, it also works in rabbits. So the likelihood that this would also work in dogs is probably quite high. When we have mixtures, this is a, a binary mixture. So in many cases, binary mixtures don't do this, but when you have mixtures that have four, five, six components, configural processing is actually the more likely thing to happen than is going to be analytical processing. So our question came up is, well, when you have homemade explosives that can have a wide variety of different components mixed in. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's take, for example, ammonium nitrate, prilled ammonium nitrate. You can mix this in with sugar. You can mix it in with flour and mix, you know, the right critical mass, the right detonator, things like that. You know, a couple of things I'll, I'll arm wave away. You have an explosive. However, if I take away some one particular ingredient, your oxidizer, like the ammonium nitrate, you have something delicious, no particular harm, right? This is quite safe. You don't necessarily want the dog to alert to this, but you have one change of ingredient for the most part, and you have something really quite important that you do want the dog to detect. 
So then the question becomes is, well, how do we get the dog to indicate, you know, quite clearly, and under most cases that, hey, if ammonium nitrate is present, I want you to alert to it, and specifically ammonium nitrate. So we came up with two different types of, of, of ways to train it, and we asked which one is better, which one leads us to the dogs detecting the wider range of potential explosives. So explosive one, or sort of training one here, was take our ammonium nitrate, and I train that to you as your target. Your distractors are a wide variety of different distractor mixtures. So I don't want you to alert to cake. I don't want you to alert to just sugar. I don't want you to alert to sugar mixed with something else. But anytime you see ammonium nitrate, I want you to alert to that. We compared it to what we call mixture training, which is I'm only going to give you ammonium nitrate and sugar and flour, and I want you to alert to that but I don't want you to alert to sugar and to flour. And uh, we would change up these ingredients like the sugar and flour and constantly mix them up with different types of odorants. So that these were constantly changing as well as what was over in our distractor space and sort of mixing back and forth between them with one consistent rule. If ammonium nitrate was present, I want you to alert. If ammonium nitrate is not present, I don't want you to alert. So this was a relatively small experiment, but we did a sort of a, what we call a crossover design where we took four dogs and we trained them uh, two with mixture training, two with target training. And then we crossed them over that the dogs that had the target training would switch to mixture training for hydrogen peroxide. And the dogs that had mixture training for ammonium nitrate switched over to peroxide uh, for target only training. Then we did two critical tests. Test one, was mixture test trials of the target odor mixed together uh, with a variety of other ingredients that they were already familiar with. And then we had what we call probes. So in these probes, the, we included completely unfamiliar distractors. So this would be like you trained with your dog with ammonium nitrate with some type of fuel oil, a different type of fuel oil, but now we're testing them with a third different type of fuel oil or other different components that they had never been explicitly trained with. So we are most interested in the probes is in terms of what gives us the dog that will alert to the widest variety of mixtures, whether we were, whether the dog had previously had explicit training with that sort of distractor or not. Okay, that was a lot. Any questions? Okay, so what were the results? So this is proportion correct or overall accuracy. And the red is sort of the uh, uh, training, blue is on the probes and the greens were sort of on the mixture test. So the dogs that were um, uh, trained with the mixtures or sort of that mixture training, the overall sort of accuracy on in their initial training was around 75%. When we gave them probes that included ingredients that they had never previously been trained with, their performance was the same, if not a little bit higher. If we included the ingredients that they were familiar with, their performance was again about the same. So in other words, what we trained them at is what we got, and that was relatively consistent. For our dogs that were trained target only, specifically to the ammonium nitrate, the dogs did really well in training. They were in the 85% or 80-ish percent, accuracy to 85%. When we gave them the unfamiliar probes, there was a substantial drop in overall accuracy and they were also poor in detecting mixtures. Where this was most prevalent is in what we call the hit rate. So this is, this is a target that includes ammonium nitrate. Do you alert to it? Dogs that were trained and familiar with the mixtures, their performance was unchanged or unscathed by giving them mixtures with different types of ingredients. However, the dogs that were just familiar with being trained to ammonium nitrate specifically, we saw a drop to about 25% in the hit rate. In other words, on only about 25% of the mixtures that we gave them with ammonium nitrate, did they alert on them? They passed 75% of the ammonium nitrate mixtures when it included novel ingredients and the same novel ingredients that these guys were trained with. When they were familiar with the ingredients, the hit rate got slightly better to about 50%. So if they were used to these distractors being distractors, then their hit rate was about 50%, but if they were completely unfamiliar with it, we got a substantial drop, indicating that uh, for the dogs to be finding the ammonium nitrate in these mixtures, 
the hit rate was substantially better if they actually had training with the mixtures themselves and not just any of the individual components. Okay, questions on that? Okay, uh, so then the last little bit, I'll go through this kind of quickly um, so that we can get you guys out within a reasonable period of time. Um, but some of the our more future directions sort of looking at uh, agricultural detection dogs or detection dogs for biosecurity purposes. So we have two projects going on. One is detecting spotted lantern flies, uh, which is a type of invasive species here uh, that particularly uh, impacts uh, grape plants uh, and powdery mildew, which is a type of mildew that also impacts grape plants. But then also a project on zebra mussels, which is another invasive type of aquatic uh, mussel. I'll talk specifically about the mussels projects just to kind of give you a sense of, of I don't know, some of the, the challenges that we can have when training the dogs to detect different types of invasive species. Uh, so zebra mussels, if you're unfamiliar with, they are uh, severely damaging types of invasive species that cause millions of dollars of damage, blocking pipes, water intake pipes from a wide variety of different types of intake sources. And they can spread via boats and um, through other types of, of mechanisms but in particularly in this sort of larval stage of villagers. So they're actually microscopic and uh, they can spread from one water source to another, particularly if you didn't clean or dry your boat and there was some type of water source that was still left within your boat. And our question was as well, could dogs be potential scanners of water sources to indicate whether there was uh, 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 microscopic villagers within that water sample and be able to stop a boat before it gets introduced into that lake preventing the spread of these invasive mussels. So uh, dogs have been deployed for sort of uh, detection of adult mussels on boats for a while, but there was less evidence or was it clear whether the dogs could detect um, these larval stages of them that might come across into different types of water sources. And we also wanted to know, could dogs be a potential rapid on-site screener for bodies of water that might potentially have uh, would be developing early stage infections uh, of these zebra mussels. So uh, one of the things to highlight, it was sort of our more scientific approach that we took with this project and the development of olfactometers, which is basically a system to automatically present odors to dogs that we use for a wide variety of the projects that I've talked about. Um, some of them we use them for, some we don't depending on what the project is. But this is an automated way to stimulate an odor. And this is sort of the ways that we've done validation work. And we have a couple of publications on that. Uh, and this is basically showing that over a 40 minute period of time, this is a little box that can stimulate a particular odor source. And we were using a tracer here. So when the red line goes up, that means I tell the computer to turn on an odor. When the red line goes down, it means I tell the computer to turn off the odor. And this is sort of a zoomed in version. So I say, turn on the odor. This black line is an actual sensor that is sensing the odor presence and the odor turns on. It runs for the period of time that we have it activated, which is 30 seconds. It turns off when I tell it to turn off, goes below the baseline level and sort of repeatedly repeats the cycle. So this is what we use a lot in our lab to do a variety of different types of detection work. So this is how we detect, how we test dogs detection sensitivity for a variety of things. And this is what it can look like. So here's the three port system. The dog goes up, alerts to one of them, and then it gives a little beep if the dog makes a correct response or not. The handlers are completely blinded. The odor is moved by the computer without any intervention. So now the dog in the next trial can go to port one, clear port two that he just alerted to, and the computer indicates that it's correct. IR beams here are recording the dog's responses. So we use just a nose alert or nose hold as sort of our measure of the dog uh, making a response, and the computer is just scoring that until they hold for the right period of time. Uh, this is one of our collaborators, uh, Paul Bunker, who actually made a slightly nicer video uh, of what this necessarily looks like. So what you're seeing is the same thing, but just with a panel in front of it. So we can set a variety of different things of how long we want the dog's nose to hold, what types of odors are present. Um, so here's a variety of different distractors on a project that he was working on necessarily. Um, so here's the dog, it's in port one, which is this one. 
and the dog holds the nose for the period of time and the computer gives a correct alert response. There's a blank trial. So we also frequently run blanks where the dog's expected to clear it. And after they hold their nose for four seconds for the period of time, they get a correct alert response. Another blank. Come on, Doug. Correct response. And then So that's how we do it. Um, so that's what most of our day-to-day -day job looks like. We just listen for beeps. And if we hear a beep, we give a dog food uh, or a toy, depending on what it is. So it's actually really quite boring, the actual day-to-day -day training. But nonetheless, this is what we do for most of our day-to-day -day lab research. Uh, so question one is, could dogs potentially detect these mu muscle villager samples? So we train six dogs using a variety of different target and non-target lakes. And what we do is we take a sample of the lake using a plankton net, scoop it up, filter it, whoops, ah, sorry, filter it through a filter that would collect all of the larvae that would be in there. To produce a concentrated sample, we would wash it in clean water, put it in the olfactometer, and then we would have distractors that were using the same clean water. And basically test one was, can the dogs detect the sample that came from the lake that has zebra mussels in it? And the answer is yes, they very well can. They were really good at it. But then the question was as well, can they do it if we take water from this lake and take water from this negative lake? So lake, water from the positive lake, water from the negative lake, do the exact same kinds of procedure, filter it off, and then reconstitute it using lake water and using the same lake water. So can you find zebra mussel larvae in the water from a negative lake versus water from a negative lake to try and isolate what it is that they would potentially be detecting and is it specific to the zebra mussels? And that's where our detection certification came in. And the answer was yes. Performance was a little bit lower because now they're having to discriminate the same lake water, but some with zebra mussels, some without zebra mussel microscopic villagers added into it. Uh, but they could still do it and they could still do it well above chance, which was about this sort of 33% line. This is our sort of schematic and design for our olfactometer. One question was as well, could the dogs figure out, you know, which channel was being activated? <coughs> in other words, use a cheat. Perhaps your dog has cheated you at one point or another. Perhaps they have found some type of cheat. Maybe they have found that you reach into your pocket just a second before the dog makes the alert. Or maybe they have found something that you can give off of. Well, automated devices can do this as well. So what we do for that is that we essentially put all of our odors, the exact same thing. So everything was water from a negative lake. And the question was, is could the dogs figure it out? And that's what our control test was. And the answer was no. They had a one out of three chance of getting it right. And they got it right 33% of the time. So they, once you take away the particular uh, sample that is your target, they can't do it anymore. So it was specifically the odor from that sample that they were finding. So it seemed to indicate that yes, they very well can detect sort of these villagers within water. But then the question became is, well, how low can you go? And with liquids, unfortunately, you explosives guys don't have a great option because explosives are a pain in the butt to try and change the concentration lower for. But for liquids, you can do a very simple serial dilution. So here we had our high concentration. We took one mil of this, mixed it with nine mils of clean water, one mil of this mixed it with nine mils of clean water, one mil of this into nine mils of clean water, one mil of this into nine mils of clean water. If you're using a liquid explosive, you can do the exact same thing to get to trace concentrations. So we did this as a way to manipulate that concentration. And we would put the different concentrations into the olfactometer and let the dogs run. <coughs> when we do a threshold test, we do a very simple test. Uh, which follows a simple rule is we start at the high concentration. If the dog makes three correct or two correct responses, we go down in concentration. If they get one wrong, we go up. So here is Sonny. This wasn't a participant in this study, but just an example of the algorithm. He gets one wrong, he gets two right, he goes down, gets one wrong, goes up, gets one wrong. Dogs always struggle on the first trial, but then they get two right, goes down, 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 two right, goes down. 
gets one right, gets one wrong, goes up, gets two right, goes down, et cetera. And you get to this point where they're bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. So here we basically draw a line of where these bounces are and indicate that this is the threshold that they can detect. So for this project, we did this for every dog several times, and then we calculated out the different concentrations that they were responding to and figured out at what concentration do they correctly indicate the target 75% of the time. And this is the different dilution factors that we were able to get. So for some dogs, we could get around a tenfold dilution. For some dogs, we could get to around a thousandfold dilution of that original sample, and they would still be at around 75% correct. We also did uh, environmental DNA analysis. So we actually looked for the specific DNA of the muscle of the villagers in there. And we were able to confirm that the muscle DNA was necessarily in, the, in there, indicating that we were getting samples that were still related to the muscles themselves, but the DNA detection was substantially lower or better than were the dogs in this particular case. But nonetheless, we got a range of the dogs being able to detect from less than one villager per mil to around 300 villagers per mil depending on the dog. Some dogs, their threshold estimate was not too high. Some dogs, it was particularly low. So once we did that, we did another control test and confirmed that the dogs were not sort of detecting any particular distractors. Uh, but then uh, essentially we did another control test to look at, well, maybe they're just detecting sort of smelly parts of the lake. And because of the sake of time, I'm not gonna go too much into the details of that and sort of just move on to that. Um, and just move on to the last experiment, which was, can dogs screen unknown samples? And the reason why I want to uh, go over this one is because there comes a question of situations where we might deploy our dogs to screen lots of unknown samples. And what can happen in unknown samples is you can have lots of blanks, you can have lots of targets. The beauties of unknowns is you don't know, right? In a training situation, you know exactly how many targets are out there, you know exactly how many blanks are out there but how do you necessarily prepare the dog to be able to give you a response in an unknown situation? And how do you avoid reinforcing explicit responses to certain stimuli when you don't know what the answer is? You don't know if there's a real positive there or a real negative. So what we did is we set up a session that was made up of 10 trials and we embedded known positives and known negatives. And then we gave them unknowns somewhere in between. And basically with these unknowns, we were using um, uh, non re they were non-reinforced probes, meaning we didn't reinforce the dog if they alerted or if they didn't alert to them. So we were just asking them, hey, is this a target? And when the dog looks at us to say, okay, are you going to reinforce me? We say, I don't know what it was. And basically uh, we were able to uh, maintain responding using this type of procedure as long as we embedded it within a session where we were giving them known positives and known negatives. And what we found is that um, uh, we got several lakes in which the dogs made very strong responses to, some lakes in which the dogs made very few responses to. Then we sort of drew a 50% line to try and figure out whether the dogs viewed a particular lake as potentially having zebra mussels in it or as potentially not having zebra mussels in it. And we compared this to three different types of detection technologies. So here was basically Texas Parks and Wildlife estimate of what it was. This is what happens when we look for uh, the villagers under a microscope. This is what the dog says, and this is what the DNA says. So for one of our lakes nearby, there were two no detections, but the dogs detected it and the DNA indicated that there was potentially a positive there. For this lake, uh, everyone said it was positive. For this lake, 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 Everyone said it was negative, except for Texas Park and Wildlife. So this probably indicates it was either we sampled somewhere too far away from the mussel beds, or this lake has been cleared. Uh, this one uh, was detected in everywhere except for the microscope. This one was detected everywhere. This one was not detected anywhere, meaning that everyone said it was a true negative. And then this one was detected nowhere except for the dogs. So this one I'll probably have to chalk up to the dogs as being a false positive. But nonetheless, they were corresponding or in concurrence with some of the standard technologies um, and the gold standard technologies in most of the cases, indicating that they, they weren't too bad in this case. The response probability on the unknowns was relatively high. Um, again, this indicates that 
making sure that the dogs have lots of training with target with positives and negatives in these types of, of situations is really important. We were partially just limited to physical locations because a lot of the lakes in our area were unfortunately already infected at the time. But the dogs can detect the zebra mussels in sort of these double blind olfactometer based trials. Sensitivity was poor compared to PCR, but overall it matched in many of the cases uh, in comparison to our eDNA de detection technology. And training to new lakes uh, seemed to be a necessary component to be able to generalize to other lakes. So when you have this kind of unknown samples, a general theme that keeps reoccurring, whether it's explosives, zebra mussels, uh, narcotics, you want the dog to have as many targets and non-targets as possible to enhance that generalization to targets and to non-targets. Uh, and the screening of the 10 unknowns was showed consensus in nine out of the 10 cases with the DNA and to most of the others. And I like to indicate that this gives us sort of the dogs in a lot of situations, you know, they're extremely rapid, real time, they give you an answer right now uh, and they can go to source. They can also be deployable in comparison to our, a lot of our, you know, more gold standard technologies that might be a little bit more accurate uh, in the lab, but take substantially longer periods of time. The dog is really sort of, uh, a, you know, an outstanding tool and, uh, and, and can't be beaten for those real time sort of results. Okay, and to leave up with 15 minutes so that you guys can still have coffee breaks or ask any questions. Uh, to recap, hopefully we talked about several questions in canine olfaction. Hopefully you remember a little bit about sniffing, the importance of sniffing, change blindness, the dog's frequency of sniffing and where that can be important. And then also we talked about you know, the breed difference question. We talked about concentration as a potential uh, dimension for generalization and the importance of explicitly training uh, for high concentrations at least. We talked about odor mixture perception and how we can get configural perception. But if we explicitly train uh, you know, the target mixed in with other things versus those distractors, we can actually promote uh, responding to those individual elements. But to do that, when we have these compound mixtures, we have to focus the dog's attention by giving them lots of examples where the target is present and lots of examples where the target is not present but overlapping so that it becomes clear what it is that you want the dog to focus on and making only consistent thing being your relevant target. And then we talked about different applications to agricultural detection dogs um, and other scenarios where we might have these situations where we need generalization um, across a variety of settings and that dogs might be particularly useful within sort of biosecurity sectors. Here are different references that if you wanted to take a look at and have some fun with, you're more than welcome to. Um, I'm not, sorry, I don't know why I'm necessarily showing you these. It's not like you're gonna be able to go and read them all right now. Um, questions? Yeah, no, I've got one. Yes. Uh, just in regards to sniffing an olfactory, um, any research or evidence out there in regards to different temperatures and humidity levels for dogs' noses efficiency or accuracy? Yes, we actually have done some such research. Dogs hate hot, humid conditions, or at least non-acclimatized dogs hated the hot, humid conditions. So we looked at uh, cold, dry, cold, wet, uh, hot, dry, so kind of desert, and we were using mostly different kinds of points within the United States and hot, humid conditions. Our hot, humid conditions were really quite extreme. So we'd be talking about uh, potential overseas operational deployments in some of the most extreme situations. Um, and in those particular conditions, uh, what we did is we controlled the odor concentration. So we used an olfactometer like I showed you before, but we actually kept it outside of an environmental area so that the odor concentration was stable but inside is a chamber that we could basically make it kind of any temperature on earth. Uh, and that's where we were running the dogs. And if the dogs were used to and acclimatized to standard conditions, when they went into these extreme conditions, uh, we saw a very substantial decrement in their performance, particularly in the hot, humid conditions. That was across the board. And particularly when the odor was difficult to detect. When the odor was difficult to detect, hot, humid conditions had a very substantial impact, largely because they would be panting, but even when they were panting and they would go over to a quick sniff, 
the SNF just seemed to not be sufficient enough um, that we were seeing those decrements in performance. In the very cold, dry situations, we saw no decrements in performance. But it's important to note we were controlling for the odor there. So in the cold, dry conditions, depending on what it is that you're using, you might have a lot less odor availability in those situations because in the cold conditions, the odor is going to become less available. But from the dog's perspective, they were cool with it, quite literally. They didn't mind the cold so much. Um, the hot dry was kind of in between. Um, but yeah, the, the hot humid particularly uh, gave some responses. We're currently in the middle of a study right now where, also, where we will also be inducing sort of an acclimatization and sort of an exercise protocol to adjust them to those conditions to see if we can uh, sort of cut uh, over the top and mitigate those results. Um, but for your uh, dog who's adjusted and working in normal conditions, changing those environmental parameters or, or sort of rapidly deploying the dog into those uh, did lead to important decrements. Um, and that was mostly on the dog side, um, not the odor side because we were controlling for that. Nathan, I just got another question in relation to, you mentioned earlier and you gave an example of a very small trace amount of a target odor smelling totally different to a larger uh, amount. Mm -hmm. Do you know in your research if there's uh, a generalized list in relation to the, the common explosive compounds that's used in the commercial and military areas, uh, what small trace amounts may smell like purely from an understanding of possible false responses by our dogs? Uh, yeah, so that's a very, uh, that's a question with very useful and important implications for which I don't think the research has been done. So I unfortunately don't have an answer because I we've actually been talking about going right down that path. Um, but as of right now, no, we don't know or we don't have that list of Say your common military explosives that might 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 show this kind of phenomenon um, yeah. that might lead to these perceptual differences based on concentration. Sorry. <clears throat> so unfortunately, the only answer at this point is to train for everything until the until the research comes out and uh, can tell you what can what can optimize efficiency, but. Uh, We'll be working on it, no promise within the next year or so, but uh, those kinds of things are coming along. Any more questions? Thanks, uh, Nathan, for your info. Um, got no more questions. So just uh, one last one is, uh, would you be able to make the PowerPoint slide available to the participants via Wayne? Yes, I can uh, send a PDF. Awesome, no worries, thank you. All right, thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. And if any of you guys have follow-up questions, not now or anything like that, please feel free to email me. Um, I respond and yeah, don't, don't hesitate to reach out if you got any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.